welcome uh, to everybody. It's been uh, it's been a while since we've done one of these conversations that matter. Um, for those of who have not been here, I am Mike Tegman. I'm the Improvement Guide with First Watch. Um, our session today is being recorded, and we're based in California, which is a, a two-party notification recording state, so we're required by law to let you know that you're being recorded. Um, I want to I wanna thank our uh, partner, Prodigy, uh, EMS, if you have not uh, logged on and looked at the offerings that Prodigy has for uh, amazing continuing education and cutting edge uh, presentations on pretty much anything to do with EMS, I uh, highly encourage you to do that. They're our, uh, our recording partner for, for all of these sessions. Um, and this is not your typical webinar. Uh, in your typical webinar, you've got a couple of, uh, of experts with their PowerPoint, and maybe you can ask a, a question in a chat. Um, this is this is really an all teach all learn uh, philosophy where you all um, have the ability to to interact and uh, and uh, have a dialogue. Um, we have invited three uh, topic experts uh, for this, um, which we'll uh, be introducing here shortly. Um, if you would like to stay on at the uh, at the end of this hour um, for an extra thirty minutes, um, the team from First Watch. Um, our product development team will walk you through uh, some of the solutions that First Watch has created for this topic, um, but that's uh, that's after. So if you you want to uh, drop off at the end of the hour, you're welcome to do that. But if you'd like to stay, um, I think you'd uh, find that useful. Um, and so, uh, real quickly, I'd love to uh, uh, introduce our our guest experts, uh, Chief Tim Burns. Uh, you want to jump on and l let people know who you are? Sure, my name's Tim Burns. Uh, I am a battalion chief at Montgomery County Fire and Rescue. We are just north of the nation's capital in the national capital region. Um, I am the battalion chief, one of two battalion chiefs in our EMS section. Um, and my uh, purview is quality management. So I oversee our quality improvement, quality assurance, uh, and then you know some other administrative functions of the sections of protocol, writing, policy writing. Uh, and do a lot of data analytics for our, our department. Yes, you do, Tim. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Kevin Mackey, would you, uh, would you let people know who you are? My name is Kevin Mackey. I'm an emergency physician out of Sacramento. I work at Kaiser South Sacramento. Uh, that's, my, that's my day job. My night job is I work as an EMS physician here in California. I'm the currently the Sacramento County EMS Agency Medical Director. For those of you not from California, there are, there are several fiefdoms in California, each run by a rogue medical director. And, uh, and I have to be one of them. Um, I also am privileged with the opportunity to serve on the National Registry Board right now as the board chair. And, um, and I just wanna take a moment for everyone, if you didn't know it on this, uh, and thank you, Mike, for the opportunity to recognize Rocco Miranda. Rocco Miranda, we lost Rocco Miranda this week. Um, he died on the 21st um, and, um, and he, uh, he was the first uh, he was the first executive director of the National Registry, and he shepherded the first uh, National Registry examination recertification cycle and was a key part of developing the paramedic curriculum back in 1976. So thanks for the opportunity to recognize Rocco, Mike. And, uh, and we owe, uh, we are, our whole industry owes a, a, a debt of gratitude to him. The, uh, when you look at his story, his, his principles and values um, really drive a whole lot of um, the professionalism um, of our our industry today. So I, I appreciate that, Kevin. And for everybody, and now I'd like put a, I put a note in the uh, the chat, Mike, with Rocco's uh, story in it. Ah, uh -huh. thank you, Rob. Appreciate that. Um, next, I'd like to invite uh, a, a friend of mine who I, I've actually uh, known him for more than half my life. Um, Dr. Bill Atkinson, would you uh, please uh, introduce yourself to folks? Yep. Well, good, good morning, and uh, thanks for letting me join you. Um, I'm Bill Atkinson, I'm retired uh, president of Wake Med Health and Hospital System in North Carolina. Uh, I was in North Carolina's first paramedic program in 1974, and we did national registry very own in that process. So I, I too, mentioned how, how important the national registry has been to all of us over the years. Um, I guess in a minute, I'm going to put my hat on and answer some questions from a hospital and health system perspective. 
But remember, it's a paramedic telling you about that. So I, I do understand what you would counter when you come in because of, I've seen that a whole lot and we can talk about it. That's it. Thank you. That sounds good. Uh, thank you very much. And, uh, and my my comedic partner and uh, and and foil and uh, and many things in life and certainly in these conversations that matter. Rob Lawrence, would you say hello to everybody? Good morning, everybody. Rob Lawrence. Uh, I'm uh, half time with Prodigy uh, today, Mike. I have to declare the other half of my life. I'm also the executive director of the California Ambulance Association, and so we are deeply involved in wartime ambulance delay. Um, also, Mike, I cast an eye through the uh, the attendance list and we have folk from all over the country and also a large contingent from Canada so welcome it just proves that today's topic is an international issue and uh, 20 years ago I was standing outside hospitals in the UK as a COO so it truly is uh, an issue that uh, one that I'm looking forward to discussing. Absolutely absolutely and as I was as I was thinking about this topic I uh uh, five or six years ago, I was uh, I was in one week. I did a ride along uh, with Toronto EMS, and uh, I jumped on a on a car with a, a crew working a twelve hour shift. And our first uh, call was for a, a gentleman who had uh, fallen at home and fractured his hip. Uh, we transported to the uh, to the hospital, and uh, we spent the entire. Uh, 12 hour shift in the uh, emergency department waiting to offload are actually uh, the, the oncoming uh, crew uh, came to the ER to do shift change, um, which was, uh, was the longest time I'd ever spent on a wall. And then um, later on in that week, I was, uh, I was doing a ride along with uh, AMR's operation in Las Vegas. And uh, we got a call also on a hip fracture transported the patient to the emergency department and we had been in the emergency department for so long uh, that the uh, paramedic uh, that I was riding with used his cell phone and ordered pizza uh, to be delivered to the hallway uh, so that he and his partner, he was kind enough to order enough uh, pizza for the patient's uh, family um, and, uh, and me in the process. So um, the, this, this issue has certainly been around for, uh, for a long time. I'd, I'd like to uh, start um, and and any of you, when you have a question, a comment, a quip, quote, any requests, um, uh, please pop them into the chat. Um, use the little raise your hand uh, function on here. And if I don't notice your uh, raised hand or your uh, comment in the chat, I'm pretty good about watching those. But you can just unmute yourself and, and, and interrupt if I don't catch those. But, uh, but let's, let's start. Uh, Tim, will you, uh, will you talk to us about your... Uh, your experience with this uh, this issue in uh, in Montgomery County? Sure. Um, so, you know, in listening and hearing some of the horror stories around the country, like being in the, in the uh, on the wall for twelve hours, right? You know, when I think of some of the challenges that we've had, they're they're not nearly as bad. You know, we've had a, units uh, stuck at the hospital for a couple of hours, and you know, thankfully, we've been able to take some action to to uh, resolve those issues before, you know, 12 hours, we would. Um, so for, for us, I think we've had a lot of successes um, in dealing with this. And the biggest one, you know, the biggest contributing factor to the successes that we've had, I think, comes down to relationships. Um, my counterpart who's not on the call today, uh, Battalion Chief Ben Kaufman, who runs our operations for EMS, uh, you know, he, he has really developed during his tenure. Um, my counterpart, he, he, he's spent an enormous amount of time developing relationships with folks at the hospital. And, and, and you know, the, we're not just talking about the charge nurses. We're not just talking about the, the ED directors or the, the nurses. You know, he, he knows the, the, uh, the executives from the hospital, right? His, his relationships go all throughout the hospital and he's able to address concerns at a number of different levels. Um, because one of the things we found was that, you know, there, there was sometimes a disconnect between the executive leadership and then what was going on in the minds of the ED directors and then even more of a disconnect between what was happening on the floor. And, and um, so he's taken a lot of time to cultivate these relationships where he can call folks and he can escalate issues um, in real time. Uh, you know, some of the other, other successes that we've had, I, I think, you know, from, from my perspective, 
come down to knowing our data, right? And knowing, you know, using the data to generate information and, um, and rapid learning and knowledge about our organization, right? If, if we need to know either what happened or what is happening or, or how to improve something, from my perspective, it's, it always comes down to, well, let's look at the data because that's our most, you know, it's not, the, the, the plural of, of anecdote is not data. It, so, you know, I, I can't listen to uh, a couple of firefighters who had one bad experience or, or even, you know, four or five firefighters who say, hey, you know, things are really bad out there. And then I go and I look at the data and things don't match up. And, and I'm not saying I, I would uh, dismiss them out of hand. Um, but I try and reconcile what I'm seeing in the data and what they're telling me. Um, so knowing the data, being able to translate that into useful information, and then being able to answer questions um, and monitor what we're doing, uh, and monitor what we're doing as it plays out in the in the data. And then um, finally, you know, we did put in um, we call it a, a transport dis disposition officer. Um, a lot, this is not a new concept. Um, uh, we, we started it during COVID. I was initially resistant to it. I was not sold on its value, um, uh, but uh, we've had a lot of success with that. It's just basically a central person. You know, uh, everybody, you know, 100 different systems call them 100 different things, but it's uh, one person who has access to a lot of technology um, and a lot of uh, information about our system status. Uh, who can work with crews in the field and work with patients and come to some sort of shared decision about what the best destination is for them. Because uh, there's a lot of competing variables in there, you know, where the patient wants to go, where the patient needs to go, um, what the current system status is. And, and you know, they, they try and come to a shared decision uh, and distribute the patients in the best manner possible. Um, and we've been able to realize some really good results uh, doing that. Um, we also uh, had an article in pre-hospital emergency care a couple months back that talked about the transport disposition officer and its effect on uh, simultaneous and consecutive simultaneous arrivals. Um, and that was you know, directly related to this transport disposition officer. So a lot of good things going on. Oh yeah, and the uh, final thing was our direct -to triage program. So uh, we started that right before COVID hit. Um, and it really wasn't anything more than uh, standardizing, formalizing, and, and um, sanctioning a practice that had been going on for years and years and years, right? You know, you walk into the emergency department and, and you go to the charge nurse and say, hey, uh, you know, I think this guy's good for the waiting room. Uh, and, you know, you, you come to a, a, an agreed upon decision. We gave our folks a really simple set of guidelines and said, you know, we want you to encourage the charge nurse to place these people in the waiting room. Um, we've been able to uh, divert, uh, you know, not, not an astronomical amount of patients out to the waiting room, but more than we were before. And when we do that, we know that that has a really good, um, good effects on our uh, you know, our cycle intervals and our drop intervals and, and, um, and uh, you know, our turnaround time at the hospital. That's what we're doing. That sounds, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Would you uh, mind if you've, if you've got it, if there's a, a link to the, the study you, uh, you published, if you could pop that in the chat for folks, sure. um, that, that'd, be, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, Kevin, can you uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been uh, uh, doing in, uh, in Sacramento and California as a whole? Sure. Um, well, I just want to reemphasize a couple of points that were made. Relationships do matter, um, and they are a key part of this. Um, we're all on the same team. I think that's a very important point to remember, right? We're all on the healthcare team. We're in this for the patient. Nobody is doing anything nefarious that intentionally is affecting that. So it is relationships. Data is very important. I do want to reemphasize that. Um, I, I'm unfortunately on my phone because of the because of the connection issues that I was having. But 
uh, if I were, if I were not, and I'm going to try to get a way to share this in the chat. Um, there's state, uh, the California state manages and and holds the, the the data for our our hospital wall times. But the interesting thing about Sacramento is we attach dollar figures to it as well. So an average paramedic and EMT salary uh, we attach to the actual wall times, and so that we can see hospital by hospital how much it costs the agency that stood uh, with a patient on the wall by not having them available to respond into the system. And basically because um, whether or not we like to think of it this way, um, the hospitals, um, the, our, our providers unintentionally become an extension of hospital staff, really. Is, is what is what it comes down to. So in, in California, we, we've tried many, many things. Uh, data is very important. The state reports data, as I just mentioned. Uh, but the you know, there's some other things that are being tried. We do have a direct waiting room policy, which I'd be very curious if you, if that could be shared as well. Our direct waiting room policy does not involve the triage nurse. Uh, if a patient meets criteria, it's we will have a discussion with the triage nurse, but that patient is going to the waiting room. Uh, it, the, the decision ultimately comes down to the provider, um, not to the hospitals, because what we found when we initially rolled it out is the hospitals were holding on to completely clinically stable patients. I'll give you a great example. I worked in the emergency department last night. Uh, yes, I have changed out of my scrubs. Yes, these are new scrubs. <laughs> and no, <laughs> I'm still there. <laughs> but um, I, uh, on my shift last night, we had uh, four ambulances on the wall for over three and a half hours. Uh, and um, and it, was, it was just mayhem there. But the really tragic thing is not at our hospital, but at the, some of our local hospitals, we've had five patients die while on a gurney standing in the hallway of an emergency department. So um, one of them just happened uh, two weeks ago. So, um, and this is a person that everybody knew was sick, which is the really, really sad thing, hypotensive and just sick. And they just waited and waited. The medic started to pace on the wall, waving their hands frantically saying, we have to do something. And then they were doing CPR two minutes later. So um, this is a problem Awful for everybody involved. That's what I mean. This is a team, right? We're all on the same team. Um yeah. But uh, there are some things being tried here in Sacramento. As the county medical director, um, I've actually developed a six-step plan. Um, we, uh, there are counties around us that do a 20-minute mandatory drop-off. They did 20 minutes, whether or not you have a bed, we're going to put the patient in a chair and walk out the door. Um, I will say that that's part of this plan, but that's step six. I call that DEFCON six. Like We're DEFCON one right now which is consolidating patients on the wall, multiple units. And I, Mike, I hope I'm answering your question, kind of the strategies we're trying. Absolutely. So medic consolidation is step number one, where if you have medics that have got similar documentation platforms and ideally similar, the same agency, if there are three units standing there, uh, then, we, then we consolidate them when we send two of them back to the street. The second step, DEFCON 2, which these aren't really that risky, uh, is, is telehealth. We have uh, we are launching a telehealth program here in Sacramento for not only high-risk patient refusals, so get a patient to go to the hospital that wouldn't normally want to go um, because they're sick. Uh, and then the other way is like low acuity 911 calls to potentially treat them right where they are. Uh, and then step number three, and this is an important one, it gets back to the data, which is called turning on the lights. I call it turning on the lights because I think that our elected officials um, and the folks who work outside the hospital don't really know how bad this is. And so I've had face-to-face -face meetings with people just below our CEO's office in the county and showed them this data from Sacramento. And they're just like, they're their mind is blown. We spent 3,800 hours on a wall in the month of December in Sacramento County. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you take out your calculator and calculate how many hours there are in a year, that is a half a year spent on a wall in hospitals in Sacramento County. That should alarm everybody. Um, so, so we are going to, so these, these APOT data, we are, we are going to make daily reports and send them to our elected officials, to our boards of supervisors, our hospital CEOs, 
Uh, everybody who wants them can have access to them, but we're in the process of working on uh, also a minute to minute update of what the hospital status looks like through a program called EM Resource. You can do this with a CAD to your link. Uh, I'm sorry, link to your CAD where, you know, transport arrived and then transport complete are the two times and that is your wall time. And those numbers can be posted and updated minute to minute so a hospital can see and an elected official, by the way, can see how many ambulances are at the hospital, how many are on the way, what the average time is on the wall and what the longest time is on the wall and make that data a forward facing platform on a website, which is our intention. So that kind of goes through, that's the first three steps. The, the fourth step is actually putting a paramedic in dispatch and navigating patients to hospitals that are less impacted, which is not diversion. I, I'm sorry, I just can't stand the D word. I'm one of those EMS clinicians that just <laughs> doesn't like the D word. But this is, you think about this, it, it, diversion traditionally in its in its usual form is hospital run. It's, it's the decisions made at the hospital. These decisions will not be made at the hospital, they'll be made by the providers out of dispatch. So I'll stop talking there, Mike, because that was a lot, a lot, a lot of words. But uh, do- there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, we, we do have plans. That's the take home point. And uh, and while I'm going to be sitting in the seat, I will uh, I'll be having these tough conversations with some of our hospital leadership. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so as as you uh, both foreshadowed, relationships are important. Um, it's it's kind of a natural impulse um, from that from the perspective of EMS providers and paramedics to point the finger at the hospital and and blame them for this kind of stuff. So, um, Bill, I know you've been on both sides of the streets, but I'd love to love to hear your perspective from somebody who has uh, run several major hospital systems about how does this work from the inside? I um, I'm Bill Atkinson, as he said, I'm in North Carolina, Raleigh, North Carolina, retired from running hospitals. But um, when I was a young medic, um, I was uh, in undergrad school and was doing a, a six month residency on my days off from EMS at, at a hospital. And uh, that was the residency just to sort of see how administratively things were on. And about three months into that residency, um, I got promoted to president of the hospital. <laughs> So um, I've had some experience, but my entire career um, beyond EMS has been as president of uh, hospitals and healthcare systems. And it's a long career now. Um, I retired formally about uh, nine years ago from Wake Med Health and Hospitals. And beyond that, I'll just say this. We've we've had a a great system here in Wake County. And some of you know Brent Myers and have met him. He was a, he was a, he's a, product of our emergency department and he uh, he was running Wake County EMS and and so we we had people that we knew that we also worked with in the hospital who who um, were dealing with this and I, I can't tell you what's happened since then but I know we tried to be very sensitive to what we were hearing from people we knew and trusted and part of that was to add uh, more PAs to add more nurses to begin a triage area um, and I assume it's still there, but where you could, if patients couldn't get into the formal space, they could be in a space with a nurse and other folks sort of think of it as a uh, distant um, ICU waiting area. And, and if, anyone had, if anyone assumed a patient was a really, really a sick or a danger, they, just, they moved on in and you broke a crew off in the emergency department and they started working with those patients. And you could also always call Um, you know, call other folks from in the hospital. And we had codes that were over the intercom that just said we need certain people were designated to come down in a hurry and and get there. I think wall time's hard, very hard to solve. Um, But but there are solutions. And the key is to know not only the people you work with in the emergency department, but make it a point to get to know the leadership of the hospital. And if you've got a chief officer, make an appointment and go visit with the chief uh, officer. And I guarantee you in most hospitals, when you tell them about wall time, most of my contemporaries would not know what that means and would never have heard it from anybody. And you can complain down the line, but that very rarely makes it to the top because the staff doesn't like giving bad news to anybody. It's not, it's not what you want to see, but that's the truth. 
And so if you've got inquisitive folks who know something about EMS, they're going to find out about it because they're hanging out in that area like I did. But for anybody else, it may get caught four layers down in the administration or down in the operation. So you just have to find a way to have that discussion. And I, my suggestion is just have the chief officer or if you're with uh, county ties, the county manager or the city manager, call and ask if there could be an appointment for the president of the system or the hospital and have a sit down and don't make it accusatory or anything like that, but just explain what the dilemma is and take some data that you can leave. And you know the discussion about a three hour wait time, uh, I don't think we ever had that, but I guarantee you that would get any CEO's attention uh, in a hospital and ask the chief nursing officer for the hospital to be in that meeting because you know their responsibility is the is always taking care of patients and if they're in the building we're responsible for them so just think about it that way and uh, just don't be fearful to go to the top just skip over it <laughs> thanks and, and bill what one one question that always comes up for me because uh, i you know you hear it hear it frequently uh, from a systems perspective that mm -hmm. You know, hey, the emergency department is having as much trouble getting patients admitted and out of their emergency department as ambulances are having trouble getting patients offloaded. How does how does kind of like flow happen within the hospital and, and bed management? Because that that's always kind of pointed to as if if hospitals better manage their beds and their flow, this problem would decrease. Is there is there any truth to that thought? Well, the, certainly the dilemma in COVID, in the COVID era, and this is stuff I follow pretty closely, you've got an awful lot of hospitals that three years ago could have been on the for sale list for not having volume. And because of COVID have been, you know, had patients in every single bed they had and, and precautionary in many cases, if, if you were to have had have the experience the nation has now with COVID, and it came again, I guarantee you, it won't be the same way it was the first time when we were all learning. So it, it depends how much experience these places have had. Um, you know, inviting uh, the powers that be to do a ride along with you is helpful. <laughs> uh, and don't be bashful to ask. I mean, they may feel uncomfortable about it, but take them out, take the chief nurse out and let them ride a shift with you and, and see the wall time in some of the competitor hospitals, and more importantly, see the wall time in their hospital. And don't say much about it until they get there and see that happen. And, uh, it, and it's just, it opens a lot of doors to show someone the problem instead of just tell them the problem. But the key is to get them to come out. And if they're riding with a chief officer in a chief's car, that's great because you could go to five or six calls and let them see what's happening there and then go up to the hospital. And, and that's my first recommendation, try it with a chief officer and, uh, and just pull up the hospital and watch. And uh, I think you don't need to say more than that. When we that sounds good. Hey, Mike, go ahead. Go ahead. Mike, there's just uh, someone I've been looking at the chat and um, and unfortunately, I'm on my phone because I want to type a lot of the responses that are being asked in there. But someone brought up a really, really good point uh, that has not been brought up yet. And as we kind of joked about as we were getting ready for this, um, this is more of a plumbing problem. Right. Um, uh, and so, like, I I was asked a couple of weeks ago by a leader in the in the county. It's like, well, why don't we just make more ambulances? Right. Because. 48 hours ago, Sacramento County got to zero status, meaning all 60 of our ambulance and reserve ambulances were either on calls or at hospitals, meaning that if you called 911 anywhere in the county, there was nobody to respond other than a first responder. So I, the, the problem is, is a drain. That's the problem. It's the back door. It's the size of the back door and the efficiency of getting patients out the back door rather than the number of patients arriving to the front door. I've worked in this emergency department at times and we can handle 520 patients in a day without even blinking an eye and the average wait time for those patients. We had, we had almost zero left without being seen. The problem has become is what happens upstairs and it's the throughput. So I'd really love to hear a conversation about that about it's not about the patients arriving at your front door, it's about the size of your back door and the efficiency of your th throughput processes. Yeah, when we first started down this road, I was very much in that school of thought, right? This is a hospital problem, this is not our problem. 
we need to tell them the problem and they need to fix it. And that's great. Um, except, you know, there's, you know, I need to accept the things I cannot change, right? That's, that's not something I, that's not something that I can change, right? I have no power. I'm not a hospital administrator. I can, I can, I can tell them, you know, what's going on and I can, uh, call light to the problem, but I have no idea how to fix the hospital. And in Maryland, there's all these other tentacles to the problem about how hospitals are funded and, and incentive structures and things like that, right? So uh, we really focus on the things that we can influence, right? What do we need to do? How can we help the problem? Because uh, complaining without a solution is just complaining, right? And um, so that's where we started down the road of, of direct to triage, right? And it's not all been, uh, you know, um, happy times. You know, we've had some failures too, right? We, we were early adopters of ET3 and um, telemedicine and alternative destinations and things like that. And uh, they were pretty big failures. Um, they did not work and they did not do the things that we thought they were going to do. Um, but we've n not stopped looking for ways that we can improve our processes that are going to help the hospital. And then what, what are our processes when we get stuck, right? How do we know that our folks have been there? Because, you know, we also had, we, we also had crews that would sit, sit there at the hospital until we did some things that, you know, they would sit there at the hospital for two, two and a half hours until somebody else noticed, right? The communication center is calling the EMS supervisor and saying, hey, do you know that this unit's been sitting at the hospital for two and a half hours, right? Um, so we did some technical, technological solutions with the uh, help of First Watch there that, that brought attention to these calls and, you know, these, these extended turnover times and, and things like that. But, um, I don't think as EMS managers, I don't think it's enough for us to just sit back and say, it's a throughput problem and there's nothing I can do about it. I, I, I think we have to, to do our part as much as we can. Tim, I, I would agree with you. I'm gonna ask you just one question in response to that. How many times have you asked the hospital to respond on a 911 call? What do you mean? So like- Me meaning, that, meaning that, like, for example, we talked 48 hours ago in Sacramento, we got to the point that we, if you called 911, you would not get an ambulance. Um, and the hospital has no solution for that. So I, I, I push back just a little bit. Um, I agree, we don't have the bandwidth to fix it, but it is in their court to fix it. And, um, and we're gonna trial something here in Sacramento that hopefully will demonstrate that they actually haven't tried everything. We have a fire chief locally that's gonna hire 36 providers that is going to staff emergency department waiting rooms when they get to critical capacity. And they're gonna show up with cots, monitors, and medics and release them. And then we're gonna watch the wall times at those hospitals as those individuals, which we call strike teams, show up. And if those wall times improve, then we're gonna go back to those CEOs and say, you can hire LVNs, you can hire anybody who, a basically a canary in a coal mine. You want someone to say this patient's getting sick and you have an internal waiting room and an external waiting room. Your external waiting room is where you drop off your ambulance patients. And you have somebody out there from the hospital staff that can manage those patients and then tell you when they're getting sicker and you can triage them and prioritize them as a hospital, but it releases those ambulances back. I don't have any problem standing on a wall in a hospital and I, I'm sorry to say that, but I don't. But when I can't respond on a 911 call, I have a major problem with that. Can, that can I mention sense, one? Can I mention one thing? Yeah. You know, of course. Uh, several several years ago, when I was still at Wake Med, we were looking at North uh, Wake County, which is was not that populated at the time. There were, were a lot up there, but this county's the fastest growing county in North Carolina, and all those spaces are now there. Are people living there, but at the time we filed a request on a certificate of need with the state to build a uh, freestanding hospital without beds. And, and basically you built the entire superstructure of, of a not big hospital, but a hospital that could theoretically attach a hundred beds down the road, but it had a full service emergency department. It was rotating the docks from the, the level one center up there. It had helicopter capability, had critical care, um, wake med critical care trucks sitting there to move patients when they needed to be moved. And they were stationed there. And there, I think there were four at the time. 
um, EMS could come and turn over the patient and it was a safe place to keep them and it was not a hospital and they could be moved by our own critical care trucks uh, down to one of the other hospitals when the time was right or some other, other methodology. Some of those patients were just resolved there. Over time, I mean, 10 years later, the hospital became so busy, filed for a certificate of need to build beds and did put 100 beds there. And they're doing, they moved a lot of women's services up there because that neighborhood's pretty nice and people wanted to go up there and not be down in the mid city. And uh, there are solutions and hospitals, uh, if, if they're having problems and they're not a hospital that's broke, um, you know, you're welcome to have them call me and I'll explain how they can build a hospital <laughs> without beds and, and do that. And the, the reason, you know, I pushed for that was I'm a paramedic, <laughs> you know, and I just said, this just is just stupid what we're doing. It makes no sense to anybody. And it worked really well. It was very popular. And, and it also meant we won that part of the county for the future for having the first hospital there. And that's something everybody wants to do, like a chess game. Um, Absolutely. But, but just, just think about something out of the, and again, if you got a CEO that's not listening to you, I volunteer to have a discussion but along with you with anybody in the country. If you want some, I, thank you, Bill. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I'm sure people will uh, will take you up on that. It's a, well, it's I'd a, love to do a it. Kind, a kind and, and a real offer from folks. So let's let's go to the the chat here real quick. Uh, Don Don Sharp, our colleague from uh, from Calgary, has uh, has contributed some things that are uh, that are definitely worth uh, worth reading, and a couple of links that I encourage you to to open and, and check out. If you don't read them now, you might want to read them later. Um, and Norm Rooker ask a, ask a question, how many private ambulance EMS providers, uh, that have response time performance bonds and, uh, and penalties, uh, have been fined or had contracts threatened because of, uh, units tied up in the ED. Um, I can, uh, I, I, I can tell you when I, uh, when I ran 911 systems in my, uh, previous incarnation, um, a hospital wall time was, uh, absolutely uh, something I, I measured and tracked and uh, and used in my uh, negotiations with my regulators around response time fines. Um, it, it certainly is a certainly is an issue there. Um, let's see here. And Pat Frost asked about a public dashboard for APOT times in California. Uh, Kevin, I think you uh, I think you addressed that one. Yes, if you go to EMSA's website, which is emsa.ca.gov, and you search APOT. APOT, which um, I don't know if everyone knows that term, it's ambulance patient offload time. Um, you can probably find it. Sounds good. And uh, Steve uh, asked a question. He said, uh, Kevin, how do you deal with other healthcare facilities overwhelming the EMS system? Uh, for example, Kaiser Health calling 911 12 times in one day. Uh, obviously, maybe one or two of these patients are critical. Uh, but most have been there for hours and are not life-threatening. Meanwhile, we have three 911 ambulances picking up at the same clinic and contributing to wait times at the hospitals. Um, I'm, um, that, that just feels, at least in the Sacramento area, so I'm only speaking for Sacramento, that feels a little excessive. We do have private ambulance providers that have got contracts with the hospitals. Our 911 system is a fire-based 911 system. And so uh, it, it's rare that a Kaiser will call 911 three times in a day. Um, so it's it's more the private ambulances, but still that 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 whole process though still contributes to the patient offload delays because those patients are coming to the same hospital that are coming that not, the 911 system is coming to. So it all begins to stack up at the end of the day. Yeah, our number one address in Montgomery County that we respond to hand, is a Kaiser um, CDU. So uh, we're getting hammered by them or, and, and, you know, it's frustrating for our providers. We have had uh, numerous, and we have a, a standing phone call with them. I believe it's monthly uh, with some, a, 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 for some of the meetings, it was some pretty high level leadership with the regional Kaiser folks. Um, and, you know, we were able to, to help them understand that, look, this is not acceptable to us, uh, you know, and point out specific examples of, of when we felt their, their 
summoning us to move patients was not appropriate, right? So that we could help them meet regulatory, you know, they had some sort of uh, two midnight rule and, and they, they would be running up against that and, and call us to get the patient out of there so that they didn't run afoul of their regulators, things like that, that, that you know, we were able to say, look, it, and they had no idea, right? So, so part of it's setting expectations. They, they had no idea the expectation was that, all right, we, we, we need to work with our regulators rather than use the 911 system to get us out of, out of or keep us under the radar. Um, you know, we were able to point out some of the, the clinical stuff that, that um, you know, look, this doesn't really seem like, you know, a, a patient who's, who's been sitting in your CDU for 12 hours, who's already been differentiated, right, and, and, uh, um, and is not emergent, um, but you just want to get out of there for whatever reason, you know, not necessarily appropriate to call 911 for that. So again, coming back to relationships, having these conversations, being able to show them, uh, you know, aggregate data that, that says, look, you are the number one address that we respond to in, in the entire county. And it's X amount of calls in, in a year. Sometimes that's eye-opening, especially for the executive leadership. And uh, the relationship part is is so important. Um, um, in a in one of my previous incarnations, I had a, a a primarily a mental health hospital that was the number one blockade uh, to getting ambulances back in service in our system, and um, and basically I I went I went over and and basically offered our help as consultants um, using data and improvement science, and and. And said, you know, let us let us help you improve your process. They'd had a a, a bad experience where a, 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 a patient on a mental health hold had uh, killed a physician in their intake emergency department uh, twenty some odd years ago, and so they had they had really uh, channeled their intake process so that it was like forty five minutes of assessment before they decide that the patient could come in here and didn't need to go to a regular hospital emergency department, and it was a a very uh, tight funnel um, that uh, that that caused us issues. So uh, went in and and flow charted uh, their internal process and and worked with them to basically triple the capacity. Um, and it it helped helped them. It helped their numbers. Helped their intake. Helped their financial performance. Helped us get rigs back in the system. Um, so it's it it was uh, it was all due to having a good relationship and an understanding of of how do you make meaningful improvement and think through this as a project, as opposed to just uh, kind of saying you should go, go do something. Um, also in the, in the chat, uh, our friend Jonathan has, uh, has uh, shared several things, um, particularly about Los Angeles and, uh, and California that I encourage you to read. Um, and then um, Robert Seabree, it's good to see you here, Robert, um, said, is there enough data to identify particular health systems that are highly efficient with offload and its throughput versus health systems that are in the lowest uh, uh, 10th percentile for extended offload and throughput times and provide uh, collaboration to work on solutions. And, uh, and the answer to that is, is that data does certainly exist in some places. Um, I know one of, the, one of the people I'd invited to join us for this who's, uh, who's sailing in the Caribbean right now and is unable to be with us is David Miller, who uh, used to run Alina Medical Transportation in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, large um, seven, 800 employee uh, provider of EMS service uh, owned by a consortium of hospitals. And uh, David, uh, uh, similar to Bill, um, uh, got, got into, the, into the leadership track and was uh, promoted out of the ambulance system to be CEO of the hospital in the Alina system that had the most diversions and the longest wall time problem. And uh, <clears throat> basically what he did is he uh, uh, basically found a broom closet in the hospital and converted it into a, uh, the internal equivalent of a 911 communication center and managed all, uh, all beds, all patient flow, any patient being, you know, ad admitted to the ICU from the ER, or from the ICU to a step-down unit, uh, and all patient transport, all housekeeping, uh, everything reported to this kind of one central place. And he was able to basically use the principles of system status management 
to run his hospital uh, flow system and, and demand. And um, within, uh, within a month and a half or so of this getting started, uh, they, they went to no diversions and, you know, wall times averaging 20 minutes at the most um, and, and really uh, took care of it from that perspective. But, um, you know, having access to the, the data of your hospitals and your system um, is, is really a good place to start. And there are, you know, and, and to be fair, just having, you know, having that, having the actual data doesn't, doesn't take into account the different demographics, uh, the, the different uh, hospital census, um, the other, other factors that affect um, how patient or how hospitals operate um, that, that kind of need to be taken into account. But there's, there's absolutely uh, uh, good data and information for kind of internal benchmarking. Robert, anything else around that topic, question? I'd be happy to share. <clears throat> Sorry, Mike, I just, uh, it was more a question of if you have one particular uh, healthcare system that uses their statewide data and says, hey, this facility looks really great compared to our statewide data, but then on the flip side, they don't look that great compared to the local region. So that's where that question sort of came from. That sounds good. Thank you. And uh, our friend, uh, Pat Frost, um, who uh, has been a, a, a former EMS administrator, is a, uh, uh, a pediatric nurse practitioner and a longtime leader in this industry, um, who's particularly focused on, uh, on pediatric uh, emergency uh, health services, asked the question, are EMS providers experiencing the same issues um, with pediatric patients? And I, I don't know the answer to that question. Anybody... Uh, Anybody here have a thought? We were we were having an issue with it during certain phases of uh, like last winter. We I believe we had like a RSV wave come through, and you know, so not all the time, right? Typically, we're I think the hospitals seem to be able to move the pediatric patients through, but there was uh, 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 I want to say a couple periods in time where at least regionally we we had uh, outbreaks of, of pediatric respiratory illnesses that were requiring uh, children to be admitted and there were left for them so um, they were staying in the ED or even being discharged you know kids who otherwise would have been admitted were being discharged you know sent home with a neb or something like that. Got My it. Mike, may I yes. mention that uh, uh, when I was still with Wake Med, and again, I don't represent them, but I'll just tell you the story. Um, we had the trauma center as part of the pretty large ED that's busy all the time. And the solution we, work, we worked out about children was uh, adjacent to that emergency department. We built a freestanding uh, full emergency department for children and uh, folks under aged uh, 12. And so the little ones never made it to the big ED, didn't get in that mix. And it was safer, we thought, and better. And it worked out great because you had all pediatricians and all folks to the right. And, and I don't mean it was physically down the hospital just a little bit, enough that you wouldn't walk into it by accident. But I think it's just a solution some places can do, especially if they're really busy. And as for Kaiser, you know, uh, there's at some point, um, as I said, it is worth your time to visit with the hospital association in your state and take some data and, and share it with them. And especially if you've got a single hospital that's, uh, you know, where you're having a problem, the hospital association's goal is to keep hospitals out of trouble too. And especially if it's the media Absolutely. like that. So, so go ask them what should we do? Now, these are not people running hospitals, but everybody working there has done that. And they, they understand uh, your dilemma. And it's a safe place to go because you're not pointing out a particular hospital. You're just saying we have an overall problem. And perhaps you could take four or five systems in, in your area and, and make an appointment, go visit and say it's, it's across the entire space we cover. And if you need to have that with, since it is the state hospital association, you, you could have a discussion about the entire state you're in and get some data rolling. And uh, I, I would try that. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, 
I made it a point to have lunch with the uh, the executive director of the hospital administration once a month when I was uh, running an EMS system. Those are important relationships to have. Yeah. Good. Rob, you uh, you posted a, a, a Nemesis link in here. Do you want to talk about that real quick? So, of course, I'm English, so we've made a thousand year career of standing in line for stuff, first of all. So uh, that's the first thing to remember. But um, I just wanted to talk about a number of very quick topics. First of all, in the chat, I put the Nemesis EMS by the numbers chart in. And I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but this kind of started back in the pandemic where we were measuring a number of things uh, courtesy of uh, Clay Mann and Julianne Ehlers at uh, Nemesis. But uh, one of those charts in there is a national view of ambulance delay, ambulance offload delay. And it shows about five years worth of data. And you can almost kind of, if you scroll down, you don't have to do it now, but you scroll down, you'll see the sort of reference years and then the COVID years and then post-COVID years that talk about, uh, we haven't got back down to a steady state yet, if there ever was such a thing as a steady state. And so if you're a state EMS um, director, you actually have access to the drill down data. And also you can apply for a NEMSIS research permit or certificate or whatever they call it. And you can drill down into that detail. So that's about 43, 50,000 records there uh, that NEMSIS produce on a weekly basis. And it's called EMS by the numbers. It's absolutely public facing. Um, and it's everything from not only APOC, but also time on scene to um, COVID related matters, ILI, et cetera. So I commend that to you all, first of all, it's a great reference. And I've used it for a lot of political briefings to talk about the general situation. That was point one, Mike. Um, Thank you, Rob. Point two, very quickly, is of course, it's uh, 20 years ago in the UK, as I mentioned, uh, we had the kind of catch 22 that we couldn't get people in the front door because we couldn't empty the back door because the trucks we needed for the, for the back door were sitting at the front door, right? And so therein lies an issue. And so we developed this thing in the UK, which we call CAMS, Capacity and Access Management System, which looked at hospital flow, which enabled the hospitals to open up and give us a clue of what where, where the log jams were and we were able to as a committee as a, a sort of a, as a as a group to work through those issues and so that was something and that and it was open access to data and everybody shared it bearing in mind in the uk there we we got calls for us bringing you the hospitals were also nhs and they would complain that we were bringing them all the patients and leaving not taking other hospitals patients except everyone was in the sort of same level of doo doo um back into california and, and i have to say mike i'm delighted to see a rep and you mentioned this bill we actually do have a representative from the california hospital association on the call and i'm excited uh, to see uh, you on here and uh, to hopefully you know share some of the discussion today so that's a really great point um but to carry on from kevin's points of course with my california ambulance association hat on um, we are in the middle of watching uh, one of our assemblymen, Rodriguez, sponsor AB40 in the state, which is a uh, which is to legislate on um, ambulance patient offload times. And AB40 essentially is advocating for 20 minute offload for 90% of the time being enshrined in basically state law. And of course, that's something that's going through right now. I'm sure there will be hefty discussions on this, but it's on the books and it's up for discussion. Um, in the California, there's also been a number of state hearings, and I know I think Kevin certainly um, has been a part of that, um, as has a number, as have a number of other California folks. So it's something that's getting looked at very, very seriously here, and it's up for legislation. And I'm sure there will be some some discussion. It may well just get, may well die on the floor, but it's something that's raising the ante here and raising attention to the fact that we need to sort it out. My final point, looking at the time, Mike, is that this is a mass casualty incident. And to Bill's point as well, that you shouldn't be exchanging business cards on the day of the event. You should have those liaisons and those discussions well in advance. <laughs> um, and because it is an MCI and it's something we have to deal with and we have to be prepared to deal with. But California right now, we are almost circling the nuclear option of this legislation because we have to have that discussion. We have to have a resolution. Um, and it's something that you know, we don't want to happen, but it's it's on the books right now and it's up for up for debate. And, you know, we're in the next in the next few months. Um, bills of bills are on the floor. They're going to be debated heavily. So watch this space, everybody. That, that sounds good. Thank you, sir. And uh, I, I would just uh, as we're uh, getting ready to wrap up here, call call your attention. Take a look in the chat. Our Canadian colleagues, Gary and Marty and uh, Jason. Uh, Jason Little um, have uh, have got a nice description in there about uh, about some of the things that they've done meeting with uh, uh, ministers of health and and uh, and uh, and those kinds of things, folks from the health authority, which 
um, reinforces the whole relationship concept. So we've got just a, uh, a couple of minutes left before we, uh, we transition. Um, uh, just uh, one, uh, one, one last word, Tim, any last words uh, of advice for folks here? I just get into your data. The more that you understand the stuff that you're, you, you are all collecting a, a massive amount of data. I know it. Anybody who uses a CAD and, a, and an electronic patient care record, you already have the data. Now it's just a matter of figuring out what's in there, knowing it really well, and then figuring out a way to, to aggregate it and present it in a meaningful way that you can not use to understand your system and make decisions, but also share with your partners um, in the hospitals to illustrate how bad things are. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Kevin. Thanks, Mike. And thanks for having me. Um, this, is, this is not an us versus them. It's very important we all remember that. This is a conversation about a patient. This is a conversation about someone's brother, someone's mother, someone's aunt, someone's grandmother, someone's child. We have to keep it framed around the patient and keep the focus on what's best for the patient. And that'll help the relationship between all of us continue. Um, it's not an easy conversation. And some of the things that we're gonna have to do are gonna be uncomfortable, but we all have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Thanks, Mike. Nice. Bill, last word here. I would just say, don't be bashful about asking to see the CEO, but always start with the chief nursing officer because the, the hearts are going to be found in the nursing department and people that will listen to you and they, they don't want to see that happen. And I just think it's a secret weapon to have a discussion there first and then go up the structure with the uh, white shirts. And um, I, I think uh, that's a solution. You've got people that know the nurses who can maybe go down from the emergency department, or emergency department nurse, go down with you uh, for that meeting and just talk about the problem and make sure that nursing understands why you're having all these patients being held. And, and then you get nursing involved. And for all purposes, if you get them involved in something that's going to be heard by the administration for sure. And that's the secret weapon you have. Just couple up with the nursing administration first and work it from there. Solid, uh, solid perspectives and advice. And that's taken us right to the top of the hour. Uh, Jenny will uh, um, uh, share with, uh, with folks on this the, uh, the next upcoming uh, conversations that matter. Uh, she just posted it in the chat. Um, I, if I were you, I would just grab the links in the chat here. Um, and so you've, uh, so you've got them to be able to, to look at later. Um, and so with that, that this brings the, uh, the formal presentation to an end and we're gonna uh, transition and invite uh, Chris uh, Carlson from uh, First Watch to uh, uh, share with you some of the things that he and the, and the product team have been working on that help address um, uh, the, the, the data and, and kind of real-time management of this issue. Uh, and a number of systems around the country. So if you'd like to stay for that, um, you're, you're all welcome to. <laughs>